Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Mondays with My She. It is January 29th, 2024, and we're glad to be here again. I'm your host, My She Norman, from Lakewood, New Jersey. And um, I see some familiar faces who seem to know tonight's guest, Leslie Laskin, from somewhere in Rockland County. I don't know if it's Muncie or one of those other Muncie places. but um, Muncie, we call it Muncie. Muncie, Muncie et al., right? <clears throat> So thank you, Leslie, for joining us tonight and speaking about this very, very fascinating mystical topic called hypnosis and hypnosis and therapy. Um, I, I'm seeing some some waves, some waving between each other. So it looks like you have some uh, friends here. Mm -hmm. So it's good to have you, Hannah, and all the others who are interested in this topic. And Leslie, I got to tell you, this topic is um, has always been on my bucket list of things to learn about. In fact, I once worked with a little boy um, when I was working more with children. I worked with a little boy who was interested in hypnosis and uh, I bought him a little book on hypnosis uh, and I started reading it and kept finding myself falling asleep while I was reading it. I don't know if the book was having the effect on me or what was going on there, but I never I never actually made it through and then I ended up giving the book to the child. So he knows how to do hypnosis and I never got finished through. So, so I'm hoping that you'll be able to just enlighten us. You know, this is a group of mental health uh, practitioners, probably most of us who don't know or are not familiar with how to use hypnosis. Um, and my understanding is that back in the day, if, I think psychologists or social workers, the part of the training was that they had to take hypnosis. Is that right? Uh, Chano, maybe some of you who, who trained um, before the 21st century, was that at all even part of the, I think it may have been part of the training. So um uh, I'm very excited to finally get, you know, um, uh, face to face with somebody who could talk about the topic and who will share what exactly hypnosis is, whether it's a good or a bad thing, quote unquote, uh, how it can be used and whether or not we should pursue it. And my understanding is that you're also giving a training soon, which I hope you'll talk about a little bit later when we have um, more participants, when the group fills up. But Leslie, again, thank you for joining and just tell us a little bit about your background, who you are, how you came to hypnosis and, and using hypnosis uh, fairly regularly, I guess. So tell us a little bit about your background. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be here. This is really exciting and, a, and an honor, an unexpected uh, honor. Um, so, you know, how far back should I go is the question. <laughs> I'm gonna go pretty far back because really the answer to your question goes, pretty far back. Um, my father was a physician, like the last of the old time general practitioner family therapists. And my mother worked in his office. And um, I'm from Denver. And my father was interested in all kinds of different modalities, um, including hypnosis. And he went to some hypnosis trainings, and he got very interested in it. And my mother got interested in it, and they started learning it. And um, they started reading the works of Milton Erickson, which I don't know how many of you know about. Now I know why people say when they present, they like it when people turn on their cameras because they don't have a clue if you're nodding your head or shaking your head. But um, there, I see a nod. Thank you. Um, so more people, more and more people now know about Milton Erickson, but I grew up kind of with Love those Erickson. ideas. My parents experimented on me. I was the guinea pig, so I knew hypnotic language and hypnotic techniques before I was 10, I think. And we even met him. You know, we went to Arizona and, um, you know, he would hold court, so to speak. Before, did, your, did your parents make you sign informed consent before they <laughs> practiced? Practice no, the they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I grew up with it and... Um, that was my introduction to hypnosis. How I got into being a therapist. I wanted to be a therapist since I was a very young child. I was the type of kid who, you know, listened to people's problems and tried to figure out how to structure things so that, you know, they would have success or whatever. So I always wanted to be a therapist. And then people say, why would you want to listen to people's problems all day? Um, but then I grew up and I became a therapist and I'll, I'll skip a few years there in between um you know, hopefully found the answer to that question too yeah. why you want to those problems all day right yeah now now i think i understand what people <laughs> um 
So after, you know, I got through school, which is just like the basic training, which you don't really learn much practical stuff in, in school. Um, this was one of the first things I wanted to learn officially. Um, and I, I wanted to learn it officially because I realized even though I grew up with it, I didn't know enough about it to really use it responsibly. Um, and um, like one of the first people I tried it on had a big ab reaction, which I said, okay, I, I'm going for training. <laughs> um, and I took about a year training. It, it's, it was a great experience. That was back in the day when you still went to Manhattan, like once a week without Zoom and um, had a very comprehensive training and have been using it um, basically ever since. That's the short answer. That's the short answer. What are you are you formally trained in in any particular psychotherapeutic modality? A lot of psychotherapeutic modalities. I you know it, it, it's I've always been looking for the oh this is going to do it or this is going to do it. So I did EMDR and I did somatic things and CBT and um, and uh, Sue Johnson's training and. Um, and um, God, God, Gottman and you know mm -hmm. a lot of different trainings, but this training is I find really foundational because the concepts that I learned are not just relevant to hypnosis. As most of you probably think of hypnosis and hypnotic trance, there's hypnosis which is trance, and we'll talk more about that soon. But there's also the concept of being hypnotic. Being hypnotic doesn't mean you bore somebody into a trance. Being hypnotic means using words, using nonverbal communication, um, using metaphor, using all those hypnotic techniques. And I, I had given a lecture at Nefesh um, about the you know hypnotic techniques for the for the non-hypnotist um, because those skills are just foundational. And, and as you go on and you learn these different trainings, I find that a lot of these things I already know from my hypnosis training, and they really mm -hmm. are very, very helpful in becoming a good, well-attuned therapist, mm -hmm. I think. So, so you know, you, you kind of uh, um, led the horse exactly where, we, where I was going to go, which is, you know, I like most... Horses. What's that? I like horses. Oh, good. <laughs> So most of us, I, I assume, know of hypnosis or were introduced to hypnosis, you know, somewhere in our child or teenage years, where some guy got up on stage at camp or at some presentation and um, demonstrated how he could make people, you know, walk upside down like Silly Sally and do something silly. Yeah, or exactly or on a TV show or a movie. Uh, do using EMDR bilateral stimulation because EMDR must have come out, of course, before hypnosis, right? <laughs> if you go to the training, I'm sure it came out before before hypnosis um, and before Freud, in fact. So uh, you know, so so we kind of know of it as this this manipulative trick technique that you can get people to do silly things. Can you tell us what really is hypnosis? Let's just start with that general question. Okay, that's a very good question. And <clears throat> you know it's a good question because um, there are a lot of different explanations as to what hypnosis is. So it's a good question because even hypnotherapists have a hard time defining it. But basically, the standard definition is it's a focused state of attention with reduced peripheral awareness that leads to greater receptiveness to suggestions and change. So there's a few parts to that. Focused attention, the reduction of awareness of your environment, and more receptivity to suggestion in the unconscious processes. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, these stage hypnotists are really the bane of our existence and when I say are, I mean clinical hypnosis people because they give us a bad rap and they make all kinds of, um, they create a lot of misconceptions about what clinical hypnosis is. So is it really hypnosis on stage? 
yeah, I guess it is. You know, they 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 know how to um, assess for hypnotizability in the people who quote unquote volunteer, and they pick out people who are probably going to be pretty receptive, or at least will go along with the act. And you know, you could talk to some people who are hypnotized on stage, and they will really describe hypnotic phenomena that they experience. So can I say that they weren't hypnotized? I'd love to say they weren't hypnotized, but they were. But it's not clinical hypnosis because clinical hypnosis is using that hypnotic state for to reach a clinical goal for, for a constructive purpose. Okay. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about that constructive purpose. Um, you know, and then we'll maybe go into how we induce hypnotic states. And um, my understanding is that people are in his hypnotic states or just, I think, um, even without, you know, if, if they're just in a good zone of focus and concentration, they're in a hypnotic state. Is that not correct? Yeah. So that I want to talk. About... Yeah, that is correct. Or you could say a trance state. Yeah. Trans state. Mm -hmm. So let, let's talk about what is it that a clinician wants that they would induce a hypnotic state on somebody? What can they access that the person might not necessarily be able to access when they're not in that state? Um, or that they failed to access through other means of, let's call it talk therapy, that if we induce hypnosis on them or hypnotic state, they'll now be able to access. Okay. Um, so first of all, if we're going to induce a hypnotic state, there is an understanding. You explain it to the person, what hypnosis is. You you ask them what their experience is, what their misconceptions might be, or you don't say misconceptions, but what do you, you know, you explore all of that and you talk about why you would want to use it. It can be used for an infinite number of things, really. It can be used for pain management. <clears throat> it can be used for IBS. It can be used to get rid of warts. Really, I'm not kidding you. Um, asthma, these are all like medical things, but also to reduce anxiety, to help with depression, to work with trauma, uh, performance anxiety, um, performance enhancement, um, you name it. And, and why would we want to use it? Well, I'll tell you why I wanted to learn it primarily was to help people get past their resistance, the you know, classic resistance. And Without getting too technical about it, I could get into the neurophysiology of it, but um, the, the muscle that I give is like, um, if you've ever been in a, uh, worked in a, in a group, like a committee, if you've ever worked in a, a committee or you've been part of a group that had to accomplish something and work together, and oftentimes in those groups, there's one person who thinks they know more than everybody else and can say it louder and faster than everybody else and doesn't think much of anybody else's opinions. And it could go like that. Could you imagine such a group? Anybody wow. been, besides me been in such a group like that? <laughs> group of, a group of 10 Jewish men. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Poor women. Okay. Um, so, so that is like a muscle. Uh, that's like an example of um, our conscious and our unconscious mind. That busybody, the, the one who knows everything, is like the conscious part of our mind, which you all know is like the tip of the iceberg. If we can just take that offline, then we have all those other people in the room, which is all of our resources in our unconscious mind, who can now be creative and, and, and explore other things. So it's really one of the one of the um, important parts about hypnosis and hypnotic trance is it creates greater flexibility in thinking. Uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah, this is this is a, a personal phenomenon that I experience, and I, I'm I'm sure that others experience it as well. There are times and states that I am in that uh, allow me to access uh, significantly more creativity than in other states. So states um, where I really have the opportunity to check out. So I may be, let's say states of close to falling, falling asleep or in the shower, you know, when it's very, very um, peaceful and, and I have all the time in the world. Well, 
I never have all the time in the world. But, you know, when it, where it's peaceful and sort of checked out and dissociating almost. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a, during those moments, I could do, I can access things that, you know, could relate to poetry, you know, certain arts that I can access. But as soon as I'll step out of the shower, if I compose the whole song, so to say, or a whole poem in the shower, when I walk out of the shower, I can't do, I can't access it anymore. Is that, are you referring to something like that? Exactly. That Exactly. You are defining a self-hypnotic state that you're in. And if you remember about state-dependent learning, um, if you were to get hypnotized or utilize hypnosis or, or learn it more formally and be able to control that at, at will, you would be able to re-enter. Self-hypnosis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wonder if I'd ever want to come out. That's the problem. <laughs> My family would be very happy about that. They say that every uh, all hypnosis is self hypnosis. There's no such thing as me putting a hex on you, and and you know it's not me who does it. The 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 operator or the the therapist is the one who facilitates, but the person is the one who is going into trance. They have really ultimate control if they're gonna go with it or not. Okay. Well, that that's gonna. We'll, we'll ask questions about that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, you know about whether ev anyone and everyone is a candidate and and when. Yeah. Um, so you, um, you're talking to accessing um, uh, lower conscious, you know, information from a lower kind of sub or more subconscious or unconscious place. Right. And um, and the the question that I had meant to ask was not why would you use hypnosis, but why, when would you be required to use hypnosis or what are you trying to access when using hypnosis that you were unable to access without the hypnosis? So in other words, if we do talk therapy, we'll also touch on more unconscious uh, places, you know, with the, with the facilitation of the therapist. And what are you accessing more that without the hypnosis, you would struggle? You're, you're more accessing the unconscious mind and primary process thinking which is unbounded by that constant critic that people have or the constant editor that people have that literally keeps them, I, you see it in their office, you know, keeps them from saying something. Um, it, it helps take that offline and opens it up so that that can come out more. So would the idea be to access memories or feelings or experiences that may be uh, um, repressed or submerged somewhere. That's a possibility. That, that is a possibility, sure. Um, not only that, though, you can also, um, you can do forward progression. You can do age regression or age progression. So age regression, we know, is going back in time. And we all know about the affect bridge, which is originally stems from hypnosis. Or I don't know if you do know about it, but it's, you know, if you study the MDR or a lot of these other therapies, um, that's when somebody is describing a, an emotional reaction or a, or a somatic reaction to something and you have them really embody that and, and, and turn it up more strong and then strip everything away and use that feeling to go back in time to another time in the past when they felt these, the similar feeling. That's regression, but you can go in the future and an excellent example of that is the magic question of solution-focused therapy. If I had a magic wand in my drawer and I would wave it and 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 it would make some kind of a miracle and you don't know it, but when you um, wake up in the morning, tomorrow morning, this miracle will have taken place and, and your problem is going to resolve. What's the first thing that you're going to notice? And you really have them define it from the first minute they open their eyes and go through their day that is age progression you could do it in trance which enhances the experience even more so they have a deeper felt sense of what that could be like which so, lights up the path so it's, it's like it's like fantasizing or uh, visualizing the future and then uh, having sort of had that experience which enables you to reinduce it later yeah. Well, let's say let's say take an example of you said public speaking, pub, public performance anxiety. Yeah. So if you, if we use age progression, we can have them uh, experience having performed publicly, which will then make it easier for them to do it in the future. 
Exactly. So everything that you would do if you're a CBT therapist and you might do that with an exposure, you have them get into a relaxed state and now imagine you're getting ready. And as soon as you notice the feelings of anxiety come up, let's go back to the relaxed state. You can do that in a hypnotic trance and it's just more effective and works more quickly, mm -hmm. generally speaking. Yeah. So, I mean, why, why wouldn't this be used? Um, uh, across the board by clinicians why is this not used across the board exactly <laughs> why isn't it i i don't know the answer to that except it doesn't have a new buzz to it it doesn't have you know and now that's not fair really it, it's not just I, it's not just a new it's not just not a new thing like ifs or you know or yeah. EMT or whatever but it has a bad rap it has a, 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 because of its origins. <clears throat> so when you learned about the history of hypnosis, you've all heard of mesmer, mesmerized. And, um, and so the early beginnings of hypnosis really are kind of shrouded in a little um, oozy woozy weird stuff, which gave it a bad rap. I mean, it, it 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 did real things, but but Mesmer himself did kind of strange stuff and became more and more of a showman. And and you know, act, animal magnetism is it because of this magnetic fluid it, or 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 what? That's how he first explained the phenomena of of trance, and then that was debunked by actually uh, Benjamin Franklin and a, a commission that was. Um, made from King Louis the 14th or something. I don't know which, which Louis um, that said, no, that, that doesn't really explain it, but, but the phenomena still existed and it was still useful clinically. It just took many years to disentangle it from the, the strange origins. And we still have stage hypnotists who, who uh, give us. Uh, Leslie, name. so let me, let me share with you. When I sent out today that um, we're doing a talk on hypnosis, uh, a client of mine, former client of mine saw this and sent me an email a text saying um, I'm very curious about it because I was badly damaged by hypnosis. What could they have meant by that? I don't know. Did you ask them? I, I did not, but uh, you know, I'm I, curious I would... as to whether there's a reason that people don't use hypnosis because there's something dangerous about it. Something. Uh... I could say that about EMDR too. They say about, 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 about CBT and psychoanalysis and everything, you know, but yeah. I, I I have no idea what they mean. I mean, at, at the very worst, maybe it was ineffective, but there that's your client is saying I was damaged by it. I I would be very curious to know what that was about and explore that with them. Well, can well, can people be exploited? Uh, can people be taken advantage of or exploited? Sure. Yeah, I was yeah. telling you before we began that. That I once saw, I saw a clip of uh, an individual who who challenged himself or his uh, car mate to, that he's going to speed and get pulled over by a cop and hypnotize the cop and um, and get off on his ticket. And and there's a video, an actual video of him doing that, where he the cop walked away like dazed, you know. And and uh, so so can be can a person be taken advantage of or exploited? Is there some risk and danger to that? I suppose there is. There's a risk and danger. For anybody who wants to exploit somebody, we hear of cases with unethical therapists. They don't have to be doing hypnosis to take advantage of their clients, unfortunately. But I guess hypnosis might make it easier for somebody to do that, unfortunately. But we hear about it even without hypnosis. So it's it's a taking advantage of a power differential. Okay, true, true point, good point. Um, I just want to remind everybody that First of all, I see that there's some questions coming up. If you have a question, please raise your hand by clicking the reactions tab on the bottom of the screen and hitting the raise hand button. Um, and please, we'd love to hear your questions and take them before we continue. Um, if you have any questions or comments. So use that use that form of communication if you can, rather than the chat box. And um, until I see some hands up, Leslie, is it okay? I know that you said you wanted to show like a 10 minute demonstration uh, from a YouTube uh, clip. And um, and then maybe you'll give us some insight and, and as to what's what's happening during that. During sure, you wanna show that now? 
I'm going to show it now, but first I'm going to have Hannah um, share her question. Okay. Um, I just wanted to um, talk about, you know, just address uh, what Leslie said about the suspiciousness, the bad rap that uh, hypnosis has, and, and just throw out for people to comment on maybe that um, uh, psychoanalysis also has a, a bad rap or a lot of suspiciousness. And I think that um, uh, without people consciously identifying it, anyone that that claims to be able to come close to their unconscious mind uh, raises a certain amount of anxiety and maybe defensive suspicion. So I'm just throwing that out there. Leslie, what do you think about that? I think that's a good point. Um, when I when I talk to people about hypnosis and I ask them what they know about it or what they think about it, what their ideas about it, that that is one of the common fears or misconceptions that it's somehow like truth theorem, and they're going to go into this trance and spill their guts and all their secrets and um, and it's it's not like that. I mean, I don't use it like that. Again, there's any any. Um, <clears throat> Uh, nefarious, you know, person could misuse any tool, but I, but I think the idea is that people feel that they're that they're not in control. You see, if if I'm, in, if I'm in a vulnerable state and we're doing talk therapy, I'm still in control of what I say and how I react. Now, you might manipulate me and may may um, uh, make me feel certain ways that will lower my ability to control myself, but I still at least believe that I'm in control. When I when I think about going to going into a hypnotic state. The thought that I have about that is that I'm losing control and you have co complete control over me. Right. So the interesting thing is that if you explore what people's concerns are about hypnosis, it's really very telling about their fundamental oh, issues. Yeah. <laughs> right. It, it might be trust. It might be that. It might be control. Um, it might be not remembering, um, but it's very telling about what some of the core issues are. And I assure them that if they don't want to say something, they don't have to say it. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's part of how I operate. And um, I hope we get to talk about it, general hypnosis versus Ericksonian hypnosis and what Erickson added to the field. Um <clears throat> is a primary realization and concern for the uniqueness of the individual. You have an individual before you. He would have he would have you know been appalled at, at standardized manualized treatments. You have an individual before you. You have to take what they give you and utilize that. Utilize their resources. And in doing that, just that alone is very ego strengthening. And if you're not doing ego strengthening from the very moment they walk in your room to when they leave, you're doing a disservice. And I talk to myself too, because I often forget to incorporate ego strengthening, but ego strength can just be like nodding and yes, and that's right. Or, or you know, along with pointing out their resources, but Everybody is different. So you can't have one induction that works for everybody or one suggestion that works for everybody because everybody responds differently. Uh -huh. It's a really important point. Yeah. And it's what makes it so challenging. Because you have to think. You have to be in tune. You have to think. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's a, a lot more fun and a lot more easy to give advice as a therapist, that's a lot more powerful, the strength and egos. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's take a question from Rachel. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. I'm finding this very interesting. Um, hypnotherapy also is a topic that actually um, has been on my mind. I, I had a baby a couple months ago and I did like some research on hypnobirthing um, and some of the tools that I learned really were very valuable and helped me tremendously. Um, I liked the muscle that you gave to explain, um, like working on a committee with people. I come with, with an IFS background. So that definitely spoke to me and like helped me visualize it. Um, I'm curious how you see those other people on the committee that you're kind of bypassing in order to get to that place 
you know, where the work is going to happen. Um, I'm wondering if you notice afterwards if there's any backlash. Like I, I, you know, coming from an IFS perspective, I view those other people as, on the committee, those other members, as very valuable and very protective and there to serve a purpose and to keep the client safe. Um, what's your experience and how do you, do you see that the same way or is there a different perspective? Yes, I do see that in, in a similar way. And it's a very, very good question. Um, in in an IFS perspective or, or what I, my background is more ego state therapy, which is similar to IFS. It's recognizing that we have different parts that came into existence in different points in our lives when we needed a certain coping strategy. Um, or they are interjects or whatever they are, including those protective parts or what I call the conscious mind. But when I talk about the conscious mind, I'm not really talking about it as the protector part because in that committee that's still left after the conscious mind checks out or goes away, um, you have protector parts in there and you get the parts to work together to be able to appreciate how they can work together and how to like like family therapy or something like that where each part has you have to realize that each part has a constructive purpose but they have to learn how to be able to work together but but your point of that conscious part you know if I put the conscious part asleep or I have it go someplace while I'm working with all the parts of the unconscious mind then we have to bring it back together so that now the unconscious and the conscious can work together so that the conscious mind is receptive to some of the work that's been done during that trance to be able to not, you know, to be able to let it, let it happen. It's a very good question. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's go to Ziesel. Go ahead, Ziesel. Hi. Okay. First of all, I just want to let you know that I reached out to your office today and I spoke oh. to your secretary. Great. Um, hypnosis is something that I'm looking to um, be, you know, uh, to know that. So that was, that's very interesting. Um, Wait, could I you asked... tell us, Leslie, tell us about the training for the, all the oh. people over here. Okay. Um, it's a level one training. It's an ASH approved. ASH is the American Society for Clinical Hypnosis. And it's a wonderful, very large organization with a lot of top people in it. And they have, uh, um, they offer a certification and they off, they have standards, <clears throat> excuse me, for the different levels of training. So I worked hard to get <clears throat> this level one to, um, to be approved by them. So if you take the level one, which is about 21, 22 hours, um, that gets you partway to your certification. And the way I constructed it, I told you that my original training was over a year going once a week to the city, which is a model we can't do nowadays because nobody's going to schlep to the city once a week because of Zoom. So what I did do was I made it a hybrid training. So I have like three hours on Zoom, which is mostly didactic. A week later, I have a Sunday and a Monday full days in person because I really feel that that's important and I'll go back to why. And then the following week, another three hours on Zoom. So somebody has to just be here for two full days. Um, the reason why I did that, there are there are hypnosis trainings, ASH approved hypnosis trainings, and I would definitely do something that's approved because it just is, is it has to adhere to a certain standard um, that are 100% on Zoom, which seems to be fine for some people. For me, I would not want to train that way personally because I think that there's so much live in person that you don't get over Zoom, including watching the respiration rate that's part of being in sync with somebody and, and certain cues like that. I just wouldn't want to learn that over Zoom or to do that over Zoom too much. So that's why I, I constructed the training like that. So this training is going to be in March. I just completed one in January, and this one is going to be in March. And how, how could somebody access it if they want to find it? Ah, um, they can go to my website and click on hypnosis trainings. And my website is rocklandtherapists.com. Or maybe they could Google me. I'm I'm embarrassed to tell you. I'm not exactly sure what my website is, but I think it's rocklandtherapists.com. 
Okay. ZC, Can you say ahead. that again, please? Rocklandtherapists.com. Okay. Let me just make sure that that's right. Uh, that's good. Okay, ZC, go ahead, Cecil. Okay, fine. So my question here is a bit complicated. So being that I know how hypnosis works just a little bit, tiny little bit, and I'm working with men as well. And sometimes I see clients being extremely stuck in a certain situation. And I feel like I want to jump into that, into their mind, give it that fix, and then come back and do the talk therapy, right? Um, is there a way to do hypnosis as a woman, from woman, on a man without touching or, you know, anything like that. Absolutely. I, I, I don't, all I know is like the snap and the tap and, you know, it's oh, a, I, I don't know. I don't, I know. don't snap and I don't tap, yeah, but, yeah. but I would make sure that um, you have um, a door open or you have uh, um, your, your video, your videotaping your session just for your protection, because, who knows what can come up? Usually nothing, but you know you are bringing up the unconscious, and you know, for male female, it could possibly be problematic. So just for protection, I would make sure that you videotape or or have some kind of um, you could. Okay, so Zisel, in eight weeks, you'll come back and tell us about um, how you do. I'm not that. sure if I can yeah, even. Be a, I don't know if I could be. A, I would, I would love to, you know, if you just go like that and they're just fine. But um, um, I heard from your secretary that I'm not really eligible yet to take the course because I'm still an intern. I'm graduating in May and mm -hmm. accordingly, you need to have your license. Am I correct? Let me, let me check on that. I go by whatever Ash tells well, me. How about if the two of you talk about this um, after yeah. the show? Yeah, <laughs> I don't think. You yeah, do on yeah. After, after the recording's over. Right. And, uh, and discuss this problem. But thank okay. you so much. Okay, so let's let's um if it's okay, Leslie, let's jump into our YouTube. Yeah. Okay, so let me set it up. Let me tell you what I you're going to be showing. Here. I pulled it up. You want to tell tell us about it before? Yeah. Um. So this is a clip of um a pediatric hypnosis. It's something called glove anesthesia, where this practitioner is teaching this girl because she has to have a lot of blood work. And if you have people that have needle phobias, this is a great treatment for them. And she is um, teaching her how to not feel it so much, um, or otherwise known as pain reduction. But what I love about this clip is it shows how different working with children is. So um, watch it and then we'll talk about it. Put it on you. Daddy. Sure. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, time for the magic love. Okay. So let's put your yeah. my hand. And let me grab my magic glove out of my pocket here. And let's put it on. That's it. The magic love is a versatile and quick hypnotic technique to create okay. analgesia mm -hmm. and therefore comfort during medical procedures. Yeah. The needles for IVs, blood draws, porta cats, and immunizations. As a result, it's immensely helpful in controlling a child's anticipatory anxiety and fears during the procedure. It's ideal for children 3 to 11 years, and parents can learn to apply it too. That's mm -hmm. it. There we go. a lot of needles in different places okay we are going to use the magic glove because it's a wonderful way to protect your hand or your arm or your shoulder or wherever you need it so that you can feel safe and the thing about the magic glove it's wherever you need it here it is so i am going to put it on this hand. Thanks, honey. And you just relax. Very good. Now, I need you to really concentrate because as this glove goes on, it protects your hand so that you know what's going on, but you're not bothered. And here we go. We're putting it on the middle finger and I snuck it up on the finger and then I make sure it goes right the way up 
and this one can you feel how nice that is as the magic goes on it's protecting your hand jazzy there honey that's right over your thumb let's just make sure it's on really nice and we've taken it up to here but in a moment I'm going to take it higher first of all I would like you to feel the difference okay this hand doesn't have the magic glove right so I'm taking mm -hmm. the pencil and let's test this one one two three that's full feeling 10 out of 10 but this will probably be different because the magic glove is on do you oh my see goodness I didn't feel anything <laughs> That's marvelous. Now, Jazzy, let's let's play. A, uh, put the number to this. If this is ten, I'll just touch you once. Mm -hmm. What is this one? Out of if ten is full feeling, and zero is no feeling, and five is half. If that is ten, what do you think this is? How does this feel? Probably two. Two! That's magnificent! Now that the magic love is working so beautifully and we only took it up to here, let's take it to be a beautiful long glove all the way up to here. You know like those evening gloves? The reason we're doing that is sometimes you have blood work there, right? And so you can feel my hand is making sure that that little corner gets covered beautifully by the glove. Oh, Jazzy, you're concentrating so beautifully. Can you feel how? Yes, the glove is protecting you so that you know what's going on, but you're not bothered. Now I'm going to show you a lovely trick because sometimes you also have injections here, right? Now that the magic glove is on and some, you only need it to be here for this, we're going to transfer the numbness, the mm -hmm. good feeling, the safe protection to this part. And let's make sure it's right over that muscle. This is where the muscle is hung. So put your arm a bit further down. That's it. Now concentrate and transfer, that's it, all of the protection, safe, good feeling to the top of your arm so that if you have any procedure or needle there, you know that it's safe, safe, safe and protected. And you just tell me, nod your head when it's done. Wonderful job, mm. Jazzy. Here I go. No. Ooh, <laughs> I know. That's 10. And what is this? Probably about two. Wow, you're so good at this. I, could, I bet you could bring it down further. Would you like to, to bring it down further? Take this magic glove, it's still on this hand. And before you reverse, there you go. Put it back here. Concentrate again. You did so well. Just send the happy, protected feeling into your arm. Oh, that's it, Jack. Nod your head when you're done again. It's a wonderful to know. You do this for yourself, and you can do it wherever you want. Yeah. So let's test it. Good. There. I know you don't like that, <laughs> <laughs> but isn't it wonderful? You can handle it here. That just shows how well this is working. And what number is it? Hold on, half. Wowie, wowie, well done, Jazzy. That's fantastic. Okay, honey, now you know how to use the magic glove. 
and it can stay on as long as you need it. So sit up here, hun. Good mm. girl. I'm just going to make sure that now that it's on, you can have whatever kind of needle you need to. And I will give you your own magic glove to take home. I think it's a little bit stuck, but I think that that gives the main main points. We don't have to see her undo it. She undoes it at the end. She tells her how to take it off and everything. With mommy. So Jazzy, we need to reverse it so that every factor feeling normal, so that you know it works and you can do it again. So let's take off. That's it. Very good. Also making sure that the whole piece comes off that lung. It, yes, yes, off that finger. Thank off. you. Off that one. Off. Off, off, and now get off the magic glove. Yes, let's test here first. Yep, that is okay. What about here? Yep, yep. Now, what I'd like you to do is rub your hands together like that. Good. How do they feel now? The same. Wow. Mm. Well, in that case, here you go. Here, take your magic glove and keep it safe. Jazzy, you've done a beautiful job. And the wonderful thing about this magic glove is wherever you need it, there it is. It's yours. Thank you. Thank you. So um, that is a wonderful illustration of hypnosis with children, which it looks so different. I mean, that is not what you would expect when you think of a hypnotic trance, is it? He didn't, she didn't do a formal induction and eyes closed and the kid didn't look like she was half asleep. She was engaged, but it, it points to hypnosis being that absorption of attention. The child was very absorbed. And there was ego strengthening throughout. Wonderful job. And isn't that wonderful that you can do this anytime for yourself? And good job, Jesse. She constantly it was peppered throughout those ego strengthening phrases and, and the content. And how much, how, how much more empowering could, could you get? I yeah. mean, to be able to teach somebody to be able to regulate pain like that, I think it's pretty amazing. So is that is that not something that ever, after we having watched that is that not something we can replicate or mimic is there something that was so profound or complex or I don't you know? I don't think so you could probably mimic that you won't know exactly you know um the like the, if, you, if you get foot could you get footnotes on what she was actually doing more than that meet, that meets the eye Okay, I can do that. But first, I would, can I open it up and see what people noticed and what they think she used to absorb the attention of the child? Or does that create chaos if we do that? No, let's do it. Let's okay. do it. Okay. I see Brooklyn and Breeze, so good. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That was beautiful. That's like the word that comes to mind. Um, it's so, I guess, just for me, at least there's some, there's a feeling of like, there's a way to help children deal with pain, like manage their own pain, which is such a, like a liberating feeling almost. Um, but I'm curious what happens when the nurse comes in bearing the needles in front of the child and the child sees the needles. How does this hypnotic state, um, I guess, does it prevent the child from just freaking out, like reverting to, mm -hmm. the child can sustain this even with like the, the trigger, so to speak, right in front of her. Yes, because the child is now empowered to be able to face it. And she might actually be looking forward to the challenge. She's She's got this magic love, you know, she's applied it. And she's done all that stuff. And, and she's probably looking forward to trying it out. This is a kid who's had multiple sticks with needles. So she's, it's not a new thing to her. Um, 
but what you bring up a very good point, and that is, you know, these these triggers. We spend a lot of time avoiding triggers. It's really not the way to inoculate us for stress, as, as we know. The more we avoid those things, the more our anxiety grows. You have to be able to have exposure. So here she's talking about, and, and here we want to go up further because sometimes you have to have blood drawn there. She's not couching it in terms of what well, you're going to have pencil prick. She's talking about needles and things. So it's preparing her for what she needs. Thank you. Oh, no, go ahead. Anna Mark. You have to unmute. Yeah, 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 un yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, I think everyone has been saying this, but what I found so skillful about uh, the, this practitioner is just about everything that she said, every part of her intervention was meant to induce in this little girl mastery. She can master, she can do this, she can do this for herself. Uh, and just as I've done this for you, and she repeated these gestures on her arm many times, uh, you can do this for yourself. And here's your magic glove, it's yours to keep. It was done so subtly. Um, uh, and I, uh, I I just appreciated the skill with which that was done to enable this child to uh, to feel that she can master this herself. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And in fact, in the session, she had her rehearse doing it herself by transferring it, right? And, and you exactly. nod when it's, when it's ready. And the kid naturally, she wasn't told to do this. She was naturally like funneling that, you know, numbing thing into her arm. So it, it's a very good point. A very good point. I'm, I'm curious. Um, this is an, I guess, a fundamental question. But what about the pain itself? Where does the pain go? In other well, words, how, how much of pain is our physical nerves react reacting to things versus our emotional fears and whatnot reacting to things? What happens to the pain itself? It's a, it's a very, very good question. You know, pain, pain reduction and analgesia is a is a is a very big thing in hypnosis. Um, and the emotional component of pain adds a tremendous amount to pain, as we know. Um, so there's a couple of components to 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 answer your question. One, is hypnosis is very good at stress reduction and relax and relaxation and 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 just bringing down that stress response. Okay, so that kind of takes care of the freak out part. Um, but there's also a part of hypnosis that's called uh, the the dissociative part of hypnosis, where we can dissociate from our body. We can induce a feeling of floating or sinking or or you could do hand levitation, which is a very common thing in hypnosis, where you create that dissociation from the arm and have them imagine the wrist being tied to, I don't know, 100 healing balloons and feel it getting lighter and lighter. And many people's arm will indeed go up. Um, but there have been, look, at it was Rachel right who used uh, hypnobirthing? Was it you? Right. So so it's used in birth, it's used in surgeries, it's used in dental procedures where people can have Novocaine where they don't feel the pain. They don't feel it. They might feel pressure, but they don't feel the pain as intensely. People can regulate their blood flow. There are people, very good hypnotic subjects can actually not just regulate the pain, but if they're having a surgical procedure can minimize the blood flow to the area. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rachel. Hi. Okay. I know you wanted um, feedback on this particular session. So I have a question if you want me to hold it, but I'm just curious if this could work also or how this could work. Um, I'm just thinking I have a child who's scared at night of robbers. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way, like, I love that she gave her the magic love and told her that she can use it anytime she needs it. Um, is there a magic <laughs> formula for uh, protection from robbers. So that's going to depend on your child. 
um, you know, what might work for them. Um, another person, Hilgard, said that hypnosis is really believed in imagination. So when you utilize it with your child, not knowing anything about how to do this formally or whatever, but just engaging them. Now, engaging them, you use your voice. She, I'm, 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 I'm filling in because we're not really giving ch people a chance to say what she did, but she, her eyes, uh, sometimes she whispered, she used her hands. Oh, that's wonderful. Look at that. She went slow. She really spent a lot of time giving a felt sense of what she was trying to create. So if your child um, is familiar with a remote control or a volume control or or that kind of thing or or different books or stories where they could imagine um shrinking that it's a robber or a monster robber a robber you know maybe shrinking them down or imagining magical powers or um it has to go with what your child thinks is is where where their strength is or what they believe in is strength um to help them it's a very common fear for kids mm -hmm. okay okay Thanks. sherry yeah i just wanted to add on the robbers things we say in the shema hamlacha goalty and the mimini michael and smoli gabriel i always tell a religious client whose children are afraid to remember that bracha and remind them that they're guards. We have our own guardian angels around us mm -hmm. to protect us. That's very good. And if they could imagine that, exactly. You know, exactly. if they really imagine that, then maybe that will be helpful for them. Right. The other thing um, the clinician did is she anchored it. She anchored the 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 um, the glove. She pressed down here, and that's an anchoring. So she'll remember that and keep it in her memory. Right. She used the kinesthetic touch to really like feel that. Do you feel that? To to anchor to that to that feeling, and also to the situation. You know, when when you are at the doctor and they have to do that, you can put on your magic glove and, um, you know, recall that 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 feeling of numbness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Leslie, one of the questions that came up is, uh, is is everybody a candidate at any time to be hypnotized? Is there something, you know, where a person can resist it? Or, uh, and, and on the flip side, can you trick somebody into hypnotizing them unwittingly? So um, there are definitely some people who are what we call high hypnotizables. Uh, they're very easily hypnotized. They could go into a deep trance and their brains are a little bit different. And a lot of research is done using them to see what happens in deep trance. Then most of the people are somewhere in between the middle range. And some people are what we would call low hypnotizables, where it's very hard for them to, to tune out the, their periphery and and they they just don't have that believed in imagination. Um I do not use hypnotizable hypnotizability tests in my practice. Some people do, um, because I I tell people even if you feel like you're just sitting there closing your eyes and listening to me like a story, you can still get something from it. And and the research does show that even a light trance can be productive. So I think that kind of takes the performance anxiety out of it. Everybody the first few times I don't know is this hypnosis. I don't know if I'm really hypnotized. And a lot of times they are, but they might be still wondering that. So there are a lot of similarities. If you do mindfulness meditation with people, I say, you know, your experience is whatever it is right now. And it might be different every time. And that's okay. Even within one session, you might find yourself going deeper, feeling you're lighter. Maybe you're questioning and you can let all of those thoughts float by as you just listen to my voice and go deeper and deeper. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that was leading to my next question, which is, how do you actually, you, you know, you said this is more child-based, the, the video that we watched. Yeah. What, what would be a, a typical um, process of inducing a hypnotic trance in somebody? And so, what's, what's, what's sort of the uh, tenet behind it? What are you doing? 
Okay. So a typical formalized trance. And when I say formalized, there's conversational trance and things like that where it's less formal. But let's talk about the formalized trance. So after orienting the person towards hypnosis and getting a history and, and defining goals and all of that, which is a part of the process, that is the very first part. And a big part of that is also uh, seeding expectancy, seeding expectancy that, that this is going to work for them. So after that, you do the induction, which is an invitation to trance. And there are many different ways that that can be done. Many, many, many different ways. There could be, you could do progressive muscle relaxation. You could do eye fixation where they have to stare at a point. Usually it helps if it's higher than eye level and you count slowly from one to three with each number in the count, their eyelids are gonna get heavier and heavier and you describe certain phenomena that they're probably experiencing until finally when you get to three, they close their eyes. So that's the beginning of the trance. That is the, remember the funneling, the, the focusing of attention now. Okay, so they're really at the, they've, they've opened the door to the trance. Then you deepen the trance by experiencing, having them experience either metaphors of going down, going down steps, elevators, escalators, paths, or slowing down your speech and more pauses. That also can be a deepening technique. Another deepening technique is actually something called fractionation, where you take somebody down and then up and then down even more. That's called fractionation. So that also deepens. Once they're at a an appropriately deep level, and I always say whatever level is good for you today, right? Because there could be resistance and all of that. Some people might be nervous about trance and, and the level of trance and if you're going to take over the mind. And then you see the suggestions. So that is a whole course worth, but you can use direct suggestions where you're very direct about what you're suggesting or you use indirect suggestions where their mind connects the dots more which i think is much more effective depending on the person you can use metaphors to help their mind connect the dots in a meaningful way for them and you can leave it pretty um open like a Rorschach test and their their unconscious mind, depending on their level of development, will connect the dots that works best for them. And then after they've done that work, you you anchor it and you can make post-hypnotic suggestions. So if it's like the performance anxiety and you know you wish you come out and you're gonna bring everything that's positive with you and when you get ready for your performance, as soon as you feel any of those butterflies, you will immediately be able to reconnect to this feeling of calm, confidence. You could give them a symbol, like a concrete symbol that if you bring your fingers together, that will remind you of this feeling and you build that into the trance. So they've already done it in the trance and then you you help them re-alert and you have to make sure that they are completely re-alerted not walking walking out of your house your your office in a daze. Mm -hmm. Will they will they come back to themselves by themselves? Will they come back by themselves? To themselves by themselves? Um so that's a very good question. Usually yes, there are some people who do and when you're ready you'll come out of trance. But if somebody's in a nice deep trance, they don't really like to come out. Mm -hmm. It's nice down there. Um so you, I, I usually take people out more formally and and you use your voice to bring them out. Um, sometimes there's resistance to coming out, uh, especially with more dissociative clients. And so there are ways to deal with that where either you could get more active in bringing them out, but what I find usually works best is asking them, you check in with them, if there's something that feels like unfinished business, 
something, you know, it seems like you don't want to come out. Is there is the part that needs to say something more? Mm -hmm. Usually mm -hmm. there is. And and when you check in with the person and you have more of a dialogue in the trance, that's really the most helpful. Speaking of dialogues, I really should talk about this element in trance of, of having a dialogue with the person because the person can speak in trance and you can do hypnoanalysis with them. And you can also, I've used um, the computer and a keyboard for them to be able to communicate by a keyboard if they feel like they can't speak. So that's also very useful. That's great. So using different forms of communication that enable them to stay in the trance without getting disrupted, I guess. Right, exactly. And what's Ericksonian? You said there's a difference between hypnosis and Ericksonian hypnosis. Well, Ericksonian is is less direct and authoritative. It's not, and I will count and you will be asleep or sleep now. Or, although he did that sometimes, but it was much more individualistic, paying attention to the individual, what their resources are, and tailoring it for their specific needs and what works for them in a nutshell great that's that's great malco go ahead uh i'm taking it off to a, a little angle could you see this approach being um imposed in israel for the mass trauma there's like ain't the dove herself there could you see using hypnosis as a modality that could and should be taught there from every angle. I mean, there's just n n no uh, lack of trauma there. I'm gonna go off and let you. Yeah, that that is a sore point for me, Malka, and I'll tell you why. Okay, then I'll stay listening. <laughs> 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 yeah. Israel, oddly enough, has a law that unless you are a PhD or an MD, you can't use hypnosis. Still figure. You know, I I wish I could do something about that. At one time, I actually tried, but um, they're a little bit in the dark ages there. So, yes, I think it would be very helpful. So, they, yes, that's my it. better question. Things may change. The laws may change. There's such, and we have about 9 million people who are all traumatized in multiple uh, derivatives. So. Yeah. Assuming that angle is addressed, it would what be do you very think helpful. That... It would be very helpful, definitely. I, I think can hypnosis be done in a group, like in a group setting? You can use it in a group setting, sure. I mean, when I do my training, I do some some group trances. You have to, you know, be monitoring everybody, and of course, you can't quite tailor it individually, but. You do, you know, there are group trances that you can do, sure. I was reminded when Rachel was talking about her daughter, because my granddaughter, who is living there, um, suddenly can't sleep at night either. Mm -hmm. And did you check the the mamad and is anyone mm -hmm. there and blah, blah, blah. And mm -hmm. I can't sleep and there are bad people. And I'm thinking this could be- uh, It could be helpful. Yeah. Wonderful for all the kids. I'm saying there's just a, a no lack of opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Let's take Shandel. Go ahead, Shandel. Speaking of Israel. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi. Thank you. Um, I want to ask: Can you use it in couples therapy? And my direct question is: What's changing in the person's mind from hyp hypnosis? So let's say if there is a lot of animosity between a couple. Can through hypnosis can it improve or let get less or decrease mm. whatever? Mm, that's an excellent question. You could use it in, in couples therapy, but keep in mind that to be able to go into trance and to utilize it, there has to be a certain amount of trust and comfort there. So if you have a real contentious couple, they might not feel so comfortable going into trance with each other there. It depends on the couple and where they're holding. Um, but theoretically it could be it could be helpful. Does that answer your question? So theoretically it can be like a life-changing situation if there is animosity or anger. 
if yes, if they are able to go into trance and be open to that primary process thinking and being able to see things from a different angle, which is what hypnosis allows us to do, to be able to increase cognitive flexibility and to see things from different angles, then yeah, it could be a game changer. Yeah, but you can also work with every person individually, not as a couple. Say that again. So let's say if there are not, there is not enough comfort that they can't work together and get into trends. So you can work, let's say, separately with the wife, separately with the right. husband. Right. Right. And and then you might want to explore once they're in trance, you do parts work. If they have a resistance to being able to understand where their spouse is coming from, what what part is having a hard time here? Mm -hmm. What part is you know, pushing that away and be, being able to do parts work like that, ego state therapy. I'm starting to get very excited because I can see the change it makes in couples. So great. Thank you. Okay, Sherry, go ahead. I just have a question. Do you consider visualization part of the hypnosis process? It can be. Not everybody is visual, most people are. Um, again, if you think of hypnosis as believed in imagination, um, and what 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 do you mean by imagination as being part of the hypnosis project? Yeah, like I, because you said that you can't use it in Israel if you're not an MSW or oh, I'm wondering if I'm mean, just I legally you could call it whatever you want. I don't care. <laughs> I mean, I've often thought if I was there and I was practicing or teaching, what would I call it? Yeah, visualization. Right. You know, yeah. <laughs> you call you call it CBT. And then it'll be, yeah. it'll be okay. And, and you can do CBT with hypnosis. So, yeah. So there's a way to get around it. That's what I, I'm think so. okay. I think so. Any last questions or comments before we log off for the night? I know um, Leslie was concerned that we might be able, might not be able to fill up, fill up the full 75 minutes. I feel like we could fill up another 75 minutes, but um, time constraints. Yeah. So, any last questions before we call it a night? Okay. Kind of has her hand up. No, she's she's cheering. She's clapping oh. for you. That oh. too, but I do have a question. Okay, go ahead. If I may. Um, sure. Oh, I, I, if, if have you ever had uh, the experience of a, a very um, an ill or very disorganized uh, patient come into you and you bring them into trance and they disorganize in front of you. I'm just curious about how you assess, not just for suggestibility, but for uh, uh, the uh, ego strong enough to tolerate going into a trance. Right. I don't think I can um, answer that on one foot, um, but if you have a doubt, then go without. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I have done it with dissociative patients because they're anyway in trance and that is okay. But somebody who could really go into a, an ab reaction and not get out of it or uh, yeah, then I would not do that until there's a lot more ego strength. Yeah. Okay. Leslie, I want to thank you very much for doing this for us tonight. Um, on thank you. Notice also, um, I found it to be fascinating and I would love to, definitely uh, touch more you know when i when i have a chance and and some time in life to be able to figure that out mm -hmm. um but this is this is fascinating and i, I you know i think there's a lot of <clears throat> trance that we take for granted one of the things i always say is there are times where i feel entranced with my client where there's the chemistry is moving the flow is moving um we could finish each other's sentences we can start each other's thoughts you know um, and, and during those moments, I even can't really explain in words what's happening. It just feels like change is happening. So yeah. <clears throat> I'm glad you brought that up. Th those are such rich moments. And there's actually a, a physiological basis for that. But that is like the trance state. When I used to do neurofeedback, there's the alpha theta training. I don't know if anybody's familiar with neurofeedback, but there's this range of alpha theta waves when you get somebody into they're in like a trance state and they are in that zone and i i heard somebody say once somebody was doing alpha theta training 
and the and the therapist went into another room and was looking at a catalog of yachts or something like that. When they came back and they unhooked the person, you know, they asked them how it was and they said, oh, it was great. But for some reason, I kept seeing boats. Yikes. Yeah. Very interesting. That's a whole nother realm. Okay. Okay. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you again and for a this pleasure. talk. And um, I want to wish everybody a good night and thanks for joining. And I'm going to turn off the recording now as I